Good evening. <laughs> Welcome to Soldiers and Sailors Spotlight On program. We're so glad that you're all joining us this evening. My name is Tim Neff, and I'm the Vice President and Director of Museum and Education here at Soldiers and Sailors. And joining me tonight is... My name is Michael Krauss. I'm the curator and historian here at Soldiers and Sailors. And we're so thankful that you're all joining us this evening for our Spotlight On program. As you know, this takes place the second Thursday evening of each month. And this month will focus on African Americans in the Civil War. And more specifically than that, uh, the Robert Gould Shaw Post 206, which was an all um, black African American uh, GAR post, Grand Army Republic post after the war, which we have some great information about that mm -hmm. we'll be sharing with you. But before we get started, let's take care of some of our business here. Um, just so you know, um, you can, uh, well, let's talk about soldiers and sailors. First. Sure. Let's yeah. start there. Um, Soldiers and Sailors is located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It is a memorial to the men and women who have served in our military from the Civil War to present day. Um, it was built back in 1910. And why was it built, Mike? Well, they were Civil War veterans. Um, it was a memorial. It, it, actually, if you look at the building, it says Soldiers and Sailors Memorial. Uh, it says Allegheny County Soldiers yeah. Memorial, mm -hmm. <laughs> not Sailors. But uh, Civil War men, uh, it's about 50 years out from the end of the war, uh, not just here, but in many major cities are looking for a way to commemorate their service and to be remembered and memorialized. Some cities built big statues or uh, parks or public arenas. Pittsburgh built soldiers and sailors. Yep. And uh, built in 1910. And then in the year 2000, we became a nonprofit trust organization that functions as not only a memorial, but also a museum with exhibits loaded with artifacts. You see some of the exhibits there on the right um, that have been donated to us through the years by veterans and their families. Um, so if you haven't been here in a while, we encourage you to come on down. We've got a lot of great stuff to see, and we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of the, the program as well. So that's who, where we are. We're sitting right now in our Hall of Valor in the Soldiers and Sailors, and um, we're gonna move on here to questions and answers. Um, if you have any questions this evening, we'd be happy to look at those. And if you're on Facebook, all you have to do is submit a comment. And if you're on YouTube, you need to email soldiersandsailorspittsburgh at gmail.com and we'll get your question answered. So uh, we'll take care of those at the end of the program. A little bit about us, like I said, my name is Tim Neff. Uh, I've been working here at Soldiers and Sailors for, oh geez, longer than I can remember <laughs> now. It's it's going on almost 20 years we're getting there. And uh, it's it's really been my career and uh, I've, I've loved working here. I graduated from Pitt as a history major, thought I'd be a teacher and uh, history teacher and ended up getting a job here and have been here ever since developing education programs and different things at the museum. And it's uh, been a real passion for me. And uh, I'm usually hosting the program and, and have other guests on, but today Mike and I are kind of doing this a little different and we're here together. So I'll let Michael tell you a little bit about himself. Um, I have a degree in fine art. I'm a curator, which um, uh, when I was in school, there weren't degrees for curators. Uh, this is a relatively new field in the past 15 or 20 years. I've been here 17 years. I, I grew up um, with a passion for history. I had some very good teachers in, in uh, junior high school and high school that uh, nurtured that interest. I started collecting Civil War uh, memorabilia back in the 60s. So from that time forward, I, I've been... Um, hooked into a network of uh, scholars, collectors, dealers, vendors, um, and uh, authors. So uh, I have a lot of experience, not only in Civil War, but in other military history as well. All right, thanks, Michael. So we'll go ahead, I think, now and get started. And before we start really diving into Post 206, which is gonna be the mm -hmm. emphasis of our program tonight, um, because that's really related exactly to our collection and a, and a beautiful item we have in our collection mm -hmm. that we'll be talking about. But we should probably set a little bit of background here, um, just about the, in general, the service of African Americans in the war and uh, how that cat started and, you know, what, what Pittsburgh, the role Pittsburgh played in that. So we'll talk about that a little bit just to get us a little background here. So we decided to start with, um, this is actually a picture from one of our exhibits up above the, uh, the exhibit is this archway and we had this graphic done. Um, and it's basically a, a famous quote by Frederick Douglass. And now this is during the war, but before African-Americans were mm -hmm. allowed to serve. And he was very much a proponent to allowing them to serve and, and allowing them to serve in the Union Army. And he has this very famous quote that sums up, I think, a lot of the, the significance of the war in general and, and allowing their, the service of these, these men. And it says, once let the black man get upon his person the brass letters U.S., 
and let him get an eagle on the, his button and a musket on his shoulder and bullets in his pocket. And there is no power on earth or under the earth which can deny that he has sir, uh, earned the right to citizenship in the United States. Powerful. Very, very, very powerful, powerful. Very meaningful. Um, of course, just to point out when he says, you know, person, the brass letters of the U.S., what's he talking about there? Uh, the buckle, uh, the, uh, the, the enlisted man's buckle actually says U.S. Right. right. So it yeah. has a brass plate, right? Up yeah, brass it's, it's plate brass. And the, US. and the buttons have eagles on yep. them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, right, the buttons on the jacket have the eagles on them. Mm -hmm. So he's pink, putting, putting out these symbols of a Union soldier and essentially saying, and once you allow the, the black man to serve in this uniform and carry the gun, um, you cannot deny their their right to citizenship in this country. And uh, that's really going to be something that he campaigns for. He, he gets Lincoln's ear and, and mm -hmm. talks to him about it. Um, he even, you know, eventually will start playing a role in recruitment of soldiers, especially up in Massachusetts. Um, so, you know, that's kind of some of the early, you know, grumblings, if you will, for getting African-Americans uh, enlisted in the Union Army. But of course, the real game changer was the Emancipation mm -hmm. Proclamation, January 1st, 1863. I think a lot of people think of this document as the document that freed the slaves in the South, which uh, it did. Um, it, it really uh, freed the slaves in the South only, though, right. not only in the border the states. Yeah. So it wasn't uh, quite this document that completely ended slavery in this country. Um, but I think the lesser known fact about it is it did allow for the first time African-Americans mm -hmm. to join the Union Army. Um, and this is, you know, January 1st, 1863. The war had been going on for almost two years. Um, you know, both sides, I think, were having trouble getting people to, to join at yeah. this point. The cause needed to be solidified. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and I think this also does, you know, in many ways shift the, the focus of the war to, you know, some of that early talkings of preserving the Union yeah. to, you know, this bigger yeah. issue of, of slavery. Yeah, th those topics were a little more abstract. And this is a physical thing that could be done. Right. That would benefit people. Right. So with the emancipation, it opens the door and once they uh, they start to serve, it's estimated that approximately 180,000 African Americans served in the United States colored troops. Uh, now, I think we should say something. Yeah. We're going to use that word "colored" a few times this evening, uh, only in the context of the historical, you know, nature that it was used at the time. Uh, in this case, it's really obvious. This is exactly what the troops were called: the USCT, United States Colored Troops. Mm -hmm. And as we said, about 180,000 served. Um, of course, the, the, the regiments were segregated. Yes, right? and, uh, white officers, black soldiers. Right, and they had to have white officers. And we'll mm -hmm. learn a little bit more about that later, uh, specifically when it comes to Robert Gould Shaw, who this GAR post we're talking mm -hmm. about was named after. But we'll, we'll save that for a little bit later. Um, I think I was doing some research here, and it looked like Pennsylvania contributed uh, 11 regiments to the uh, mm -hmm. USCT, which is the most in the Union. So uh, Pennsylvania was, was a big part of this. And just think about that. I, I know when I, a lot of times when I'm giving tours, I get to the exhibit where we saw up above that quote and just think about how significant that is to allow, you know, all of a sudden in, infuse the army with that many men is, yeah. is going to be a big deal. Now, at first, they're not allowed to fight, right? Uh, they're, well, not, they're not necessarily uh, thrust right into battle. Well, say. they needed to be trained like any, any right. raw troops. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh and, and uh, there were people who didn't believe they could fight well. Right. So they had a lot to prove. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, but eventually they do, and especially some of the, the famous uh, engagements, most famously probably Fort, the uh, assault on Fort Wagner mm -hmm. with the 54th Massachusetts um, is, is one that comes to mind um, and serve, of course, very bravely and, and earn the respect of, of many yeah. of their peers in, in many ways. Now, a couple of regiments we wanted to highlight. Um, one was the uh, 24th Infantry Regiment. And um, that was uh, the, the reason we chose this one. This was from Pennsylvania, of course, uh, really mustered in more towards the Philadelphia area. But mm -hmm. a lot of people from Pitts, a lot of men from Pittsburgh went over there to sign up into Philadelphia. And uh, we have this flag, uh, a, re a reproduction of this flag, and yeah. a print of the flag yeah. in the exhibit here. Yeah. But there's some real meaning behind the symbolism of the flag. Um, and I think, you know, it's it's specifically, you know, the, the soldier reaching up and, and there's uh, let justice be done. I believe yeah. it's in, mm -hmm. in Latin there. Yeah, uh, that's what's kind of he's going towards yeah, the motto. Hands. Right. He's right. reaching I idealistically up for that. Right. Yeah. And then in the banner across the top, it reads, let soldiers in war be citizens in peace. And I thought that was kind of interesting because mm -hmm. that immediately harkens back to the Frederick Douglass quote that we started yeah. from. Yeah. So they clearly pulled that from from there. So that's one regiment we wanted to talk about, the 24th. 
Um, and then also probably the most famous regiment that most people, if you've heard of any of them, it is the 54th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment, um, you know, mustard in Massachusetts. But once again, a lot of Pittsburghers served, right? Right. Well, uh, yes, a lot of Pittsburghers, a lot of Pennsylvanians. Uh, the regiment was not all, all men from Massachusetts. There were men from all over the north that came to right. join the 54th. Right. And, uh, and tying it back to Frederick Douglass again, I think yeah. it turns out that two of his sons actually That's right. served in the 54th. Yeah, he helped with recruitment, and two of his sons were in the regiment. Right. Uh, Louis Henry and Charles Ramond were, um, were a part of that regiment. And um, one of the more famous stories about the, the 54th, and if you haven't seen them, uh, heard of the movie Glory, yeah. this is where you're – the, where they really get their fame from Matthew Broderick playing Robert Pulshaw, who was mm -hmm. their commander. We're going to hear that name again. And uh, just some of their Denzel Washington uh, was in the movie, Morgan Freeman. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, one of the scenes that they highlight uh, a very significant part of this was there was a point there where they started getting paid and realized they were getting paid less right. than the white soldiers were being paid. Yeah. Uh, when they joined, they were promised the same rate of pay, but when it actually came down to it and the rate of pay for a, uh, a soldier in the, in the Civil War was uh, was thirteen dollars a month, right? And they were only receiving ten. Ten, right? Yeah. So they they resisted that and had a, a, a just pretty much said we won't take anything then. Yeah. Um, and uh, Matthew uh, Matthew Project's character Robert Gould Shaw participates as well and rips up his pay. Yeah. And it's you know symbolic of some of the trials and tribulations that these soldiers faced as they were getting you know. Uh, getting their feet wet as, as a part yeah. of the Union Army. It wasn't all easy, of course. Well, and the equality of a soldier's pay. Sure. And all all right. that comes into play. Right. And just to point out, um, when we get to talking about Post 206, uh, it actually turns out that there were 13 individuals who belonged to Post 206 here in Pittsburgh that served in the 54th Massachusetts. Yeah, that's, that's pretty remarkable. Yeah, yeah. right. To yeah. think about. 13 you know, local citizens from here were in the 54th Massachusetts. Right. So, you know, that's a little bit about some of these regiments that, uh, like we said, Pennsylvania actually raised 11 regiments. Um, and then here in Allegheny County, um, before we get into the Grand Army of the Republic, let's talk a little bit about Allegheny County and their service. Um, there were 27 men enlisted from the county. Yeah. Um, but that's a little deceiving, that number. Why right. don't you talk it, a little bit about that? That number sounds low. Um, all that really means is that there were 27 men um, who, who enlisted uh, from the county who were counted as uh, citizens from Allegheny County, because every county had a quota to fill. Right. So these men enlisted directly from Allegheny County. There were about 500 more uh, black soldiers that had ties to Allegheny County that enlisted in other places. Right. So the number is quite high. Um, you know, that 27 doesn't reflect the percentage. Right. It's a little deceiving when yeah. really in reality, you're talking about 500 right. with a connection that ended up serving. Um, before we move on, we have a very nice comment here from a friend of ours, Rich Condon, who brings up the fact that Martin Delaney's son served in the 54th as well. Didn't and know that. I did not either. <laughs> and uh, we weren't going to talk too much about Martin tonight uh, because he was not a part of Post 206 right. here in Pittsburgh. But he is certainly a well-known uh, individual, uh, certainly well-known African-American, uh, the first officer, African-American yeah. officer yeah. In, the, in the Army. But uh, uh, thank you for sharing that, Rich, and, and teaching us a little bit yeah. of something. So we're going to move on here from, from the USCT to the Grand Army of the Republic, kind of the other piece to this puzzle, if, if you will. The Grand Army of the Republic, I'll let Mike tell us a little bit about how it got formed and what its mm -hmm. purpose was and, you know, what, what it was all about, basically. Sure. Um, those of you who might be veterans or, or even people who are aware of um, military service uh, kind of understand that there's a certain bond that soldiers get when they serve together. Even if they don't serve together, just serving in uniform and meeting another veteran or somebody who served in uniform, there, there is a connection. And very shortly after the war in 1866, um, uh, a gentleman by the last name of Stevenson from Illinois uh, was kind of uh, feeling those ties and, and feeling that they were broken and missing from his life. And he decided uh, to uh, form an organization of, of, of veteran soldiers um, who could get get together, and meet, talk about um, their campaigns and their and their experiences, but also uh, to take care of destitute soldiers, uh, soldiers who maybe uh, didn't have enough money to take care of themselves, and eventually um, the organization which he named the Grand Army of the Republic uh, also took care of widows and orphans. They they had a it was a benevolent organization that helped fund a lot of um, 
a lot of avenues for widows and orphans uh, from the war. So um, it, it begins in 1866, and uh, it's it's uh, it's around till the uh, 1940s uh, when the last member died. There were um, there were um, uh, we're talking about um, uh, posts and. Um, uh, is this and where yeah, here we have with about 6,332 yeah, posts um, all across the country, and that had over uh, about 400,000 members. 400, so this was yeah. a very large yeah. and in many ways powerful organization at right. the time. And so every, every little community had a, a post. Now, a post could be simply a meeting room where they rented the upstairs uh, over the barbershop uh, for a once a month meeting. Or a post could be as elaborate as soldiers and sailors, mm -hmm. because soldiers and sailors eventually housed 28 GAR posts after 1910, after it opened. So there's there's a variety of these that you'll see. I mean, the point is that they were everywhere, and veterans were everywhere, and they um, they became quite a political force. It was quite a thing to be a member of the GAR. It, it was um, uh, it was it was something that um, that that the veterans could get together and share common experiences with. So out of all those um, 6,332 posts, there were less than 100 that were called colored posts. The GAR was, um, was not segregated in theory. Um, they didn't allow any segregation in their bylaws, but um, in a non-political non way, or if you look at neighborhoods where these posts were, um, sometimes it was more comfortable if a if a neighborhood was in a in an African American neighborhood that the post would would be all African American members and they would um, be, be uh, chartered as a colored post. There were members in um, in the regular posts in Car Carnegie, Pennsylvania, had three members that were African American, so it just may have been more comfortable to be in in the neighborhood uh, in a colored post uh, than in some of the uh, uh, outlying posts. And in total, there were uh, 100 colored posts. I think you said that nationally. Yeah. 15 in Pennsylvania. 15 in Pennsylvania. Once again, speaking to the, the amount of soldiers from this from this this state that right, served. Right. And then there was only one in Allegheny County, and yeah. that's the one that we're going to focus on tonight, um, which was post 206. Right. And um, you know, it met various places throughout the city. I think three we, different places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think three, maybe five. I think it was. Oh, I'm sorry, you're right. Five, yeah, five, yeah. including yeah. where yeah. we are now, yeah, soldiers right. and sailors. Just right. like you said, a lot of those yeah. regiments, uh, you know, towards the end of their existence, this yeah. became the final home for right. what did you say, 28? Uh, yeah, 28 posts uh, in Allegheny County. Maybe even meeting in the room we're sitting in here. It's, it's very been, possible. This, this was a GAR post room. Yeah, yeah. Could have this, yeah, they could have sat in this very room and, yeah, and very possible and, and gone through the minutes and. And that's something that's a big part of our collection is our mm -hmm. GAR art, our, our collection. We have minutes from meetings and right. we have, you know, a lot of, you know, even as things like, you know, purchase yep. orders. Yeah, I don't know if right. you call it a purchase order, yeah. but like, yeah, you know, receipts, yeah, and, yeah. things like yeah. that. Records of financial records. And, uh, and, and one of the major things we have, not, not of every post, right. Um, there's a thing called the, um, this, the personal war sketchbook. And we happen to have one, um, Oh well, there's yeah. our there's our uh, statistics yes. there about the uh, the colored posts. Yes. Yeah, and that photo that's that's is what can you tell us a little bit about that photo? That's a an African American and with his GAR medal there, right? Yeah, and we don't know who he is. Right, that's right. Um, that that picture is actually part of the Library of Congress um, collection. It was taken in Pittsburgh. I, I don't remember the post. I can't see the uh, the insignia on his hat. I believe it was a, a, a north side post. I might be wrong. Rich is going to type yeah. in and tell me exactly, exactly who it is. is. Right. Yeah. Um, but here's the book. Yeah. And now uh, these books were presented to each of the posts. And, the, um, and they're, they're quite elaborate. And it, it's quite a large book. It's, it's probably 18 inches by, um, by 16 or so inches uh, with gold lettering, a very beautiful leather cover. And what happened is when you would when a soldier or veteran would join a GAR post, he would sit down with the post historian and, and complete a form. And the form had, you know, what regiment you're in, uh, when did you serve, uh, who are your best friends, what incident, what's the most uh, interesting event you witnessed. So there was this whole um, bio sort of that uh, a member would fill out. 
And then the post historian would transfer those by hand. He would copy them into this book. Now you got 10 cents a page for yeah, doing that. Right. So right. imagine, you know, yeah. rolling in dough there. Um, uh, and this, uh, this particular post had 275 members by 1904. Right. That's right. quite a bit. So each one of them has a page filled out with the information copied from, from that form. Now, um, fortunately and unfortunately, uh, some of them, in, particularly in the beginning of the book, are, are quite thorough, and we're going to talk about one or two of them. But as time went on, um, they kind of more or less got very formulaic and didn't really give us a lot of information. But um, that's okay, because the ones we have are, are pretty darn good. Yeah, and pretty powerful stuff. Yeah. So, um, how many of these books do we have? We, I know this is the 206. That's the one we're talking about. Right. But we have, several, you know, uh, how many of those? Well, out of 28 posts, we might have 10 or 12 books. Right. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Sometimes the GAR wasn't required to turn in. I mean, they, you know, they kept all these records. So what are they going to do with them? Right. And they didn't really map that out. Mm -hmm. You know, they just seemed like they'd be around forever. And luckily, because they met here, right. these things never left here. Mm -hmm. But some of it went home with members, right. and yeah. that's why we may not have some yeah. some of those. Sure, yeah. sure. But uh, the point being here, we have a, a treasure trove, really, of, of, mm -hmm. of this GAR information. And we had a, a student actually a couple of years ago help us, you know, kind mm -hmm. of uh, organize all that information. And he was extremely knowledgeable about the GAR. We should have asked him to join us today. Yeah. He could have yeah. he could have given us some great information. But yeah, he uh, did his PhD and he used a lot of the material he found in, right. in our library. So if anybody's out there and, and interested in the GAR, um, you know, it is something that we have here. We are a resource for. So, um, you know, that's what we're here for, that kind of stuff. Um, here we go. Rich chimes in. He was a member of the John Patterson Post 151. There we go. Not yeah. identified. Sadly. Yeah. yeah. Thanks again, Rich, for, for helping us out here. Yeah. We're going to ask you to fact check us all evening here as we move along. <laughs> Good so, thing I let you know we were going to be on tonight. <laughs> So from there, um, we're going to talk a little bit about Robert Gould Shaw. I mean, uh, you can't avoid it. His name is on the book. His name is on the, the yeah. post. So we better at least establish a little bit about him. Um, you know, like we said, we, we kind of already mentioned he was the, the officer in charge of the 54th Massachusetts. Um, but uh, can you what else can you uh, tell us about? him? Well, well, Shaw came from a very wealthy Massachusetts Boston family. And the 54th was the third regiment he served in. He served in a New York regiment. Uh, then he served in the 2nd Massachusetts Regiment as an officer. He was an enlisted man in the 1st. I, I can't remember the number of it. Um, but it, it, he was present at the Battle of Antietam as an officer. He was slightly wounded. Uh, and when they, his parents were abolitionists. They were, they were very well known in the community, raised a lot of money, um, were very prominent in the, in the, in the uh, uh, abolition movement way before the war and into the war. And when... Um, Governor uh, Andrew was uh, going to raise the 54th. He he needed um, he needed a figurehead in the front. Remember, we talked about um, the the regiment was segregated. The officers are going to be white, the soldiers are going to be black. Um, so he, Andrew was looking for a, a white officer coming from an abolitionist family. It's kind of like written for Shaw right. from an abolitionist family um, with that had military experience. And uh, Shaw was, uh, he, uh, Andrew went through Shaw's parents and, and asked them to ask him. He, he wasn't really excited about the idea initially, but once he was on board, he was, he was really involved and he um, really um, took a lot of pride in training, uh, training the soldiers to be as good or better than any, any white regiment. Now, there was that uh, incident of the uh, less pay, and uh, that was um, eventually... Um, overcome and they received back pay and they're in the same wage that the other other soldiers were getting. Uh, but he comes into prominence uh, at the Battle of Fort Wagner. And um, this is the first major battle that uh, black troops are going to be involved in. And a lot of white, white troops, white officers, uh, white population weren't sure that black men would fight. They just didn't know um, if they would. And, and, you know, just really... Um, is wrapped into the the prejudices of the time, but you know if we're gonna we're gonna talk about it. That was a question. So Shaw Shaw knew his men and knew their, what they could do, and he requested to be in one of the one of the first or the first wave that would assault Fort Wagner. Mm -hmm. So that assault was done at night, um, and it was a, a very powerful fort. 
Um, and, you know, when you talk about forts, it's not like a medieval fort. It's a, it's a big, they're big parapets uh, and there are uh, firing positions all around the top. The front is sloped. Uh, there's a ditch in front of it, not filled with water, but uh, if you were to run at a, at a fort, you would kind of drop into the ditch and then you would face this really steep that wall hill, that you yeah. had to climb up. So Shaw makes it to the top with some of his soldiers. Um, they're being mowed down. The Confederates are, are easily protected in there. All they really need to do is, uh, you know, stand up and fire down. And uh, Shaw made it to the to the ramparts to the top, as as well as some of his soldiers, um, including a color bearer. Uh, and he was uh, shot early, almost as soon as he got to the top, and killed and tumbled down into the uh, into the bottom of the uh, trench there. Um, so the 54th lost a lot of men. It, it was not a victory. Um, other troops uh, became engaged in, in that assault as well. But the thing that, um, the thing that really uh, strikes, is that quote in here that I have? Yeah. Let's see. Oh, here it is. Um, the thing that's really touching is the citizens of Boston wanted Shaw to be brought back and memorialized as a hero and placed in a place of honor. Shaw's father, um, very wisely and emotionally, declined that. Well, first of all, the Confederates were the victors and they buried the dead after the battle. And when, when they buried the dead, they found Shaw, uh, stripped him of his uniform and threw him in a mass grave with his soldiers as an insult. To them, it was an insult. To him, it was not an insult, apparently, because his father um, his father commented, and I'll read this, uh, they did not want his body removed. We would not have his body removed from where it lies, surrounded by his brave and devoted soldiers. We can imagine no holier place than that in which he lies amongst his brave and devoted followers, nor wish for him better company. What a bodyguard he has. Right. So they wanted they wanted him left, and he was left there um, uh, with his soldiers. So that was um, very touching. And um, GAR posts were usually named after a fallen soldier, local soldier. And when the when post two hundred six formed, um, they wanted to honor Shaw. And in fact, in the front of the book is a kind of a handwritten synopsis of the story I just told you um, about uh, Fort Wagner and and Shaw's family wishing him to remain with uh, the dead of the regiment. Um, so it was very uh, important to them as well. Right. And uh, what we're looking at here is a, a picture of Shaw. And then on the right is uh, the memorial to Shaw on the 54th in, in Boston. Yeah, it's right? on Boston Commons. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, it's a, I'm a sculptor and I'm an artist. Um, I do this kind of artwork. This is my favorite piece. Um, Shaw is on a horse. He's fully sculpted. Uh, and, and the ranks of men are right beside him. And the first man on each end of the rank is uh, fully sculpted. And then they kind of turn into a bas relief as it goes back. But it's just a, an unbelievable sculptor, sculpture by um, an artist named St. Gaudens. And he, um, he uh, used African-Americans as models and he looked for different facial features, different types, mm -hmm. because that's what the regiment was composed of, right. many different types. And uh, that it's a it's a wonderful monument. So that's a little bit about him. And then we're back to these these personal war sketches. And we've talked a lot already about a lot about this book, um, but specifically to the fact of Post 206. It was uh, chartered in 1881 um, and met until 1922. So for about 41 years, uh, the post was in existence. Um, like we said, it was named for Shaw. Um, it met in about five different places. From what I understand, there was 14 charter members in this group, um, but by the time of 1904, there was 275 members. Yeah. So I don't know uh, if you can even answer this, but what was a typical size of the post? Do you have any idea? No, but the, that seems could vary, yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, sure. I'm sure Smaller it on community. The, yeah, how big yeah. your community was. Yeah. But I'd imagine that had to have been That's a, a pretty big post. A and one. you're not going to have everybody there at the same time. Sure. You know, you're going to have people that, uh, that join later or people that pass away or or people that are just members and don't come to meetings right. like, like any organization. And I, I think I read where they met weekly. So they I, they met weekly, yeah. which is unusual. Yeah, so yeah. I, I can imagine that, yeah. uh, you yeah. know, that they were, uh, yeah. um, you know, not always in full, full attendance, let's right. say. 
Um, and then um, luckily, you know, from this information and from this book, uh, let me see if I, I think we have a picture. Yeah, here we have a um, beautiful picture. That's an inside the top of one of the pages of, the, mm -hmm. of this book here. So you can see, you know, the elaborate, uh, what we call that, a lithograph there. It's an engraving, engraving. steel engraving. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, you can see Grand Arm of the Republic. And in the middle there, that's the GAR medal. Correct. Um, Department of Pennsylvania. And then it says, you know, the Shaw Post 206. Um, personal war sketch and then there's a little kind of um, army scene yeah. on the left and a little navy scene on the yeah. right so kind of soldiers and sailors mm -hmm. captured there and like i said this is at the top of, of every each single page, page. Yeah, right each page. so uh that's you know the kind of the, the appearance of the the ledger book and uh from the information inside of it we have uh gathered a lot of good facts about mm -hmm. you know specifically where i'm getting at now is regiments that had a large number of mm -hmm. men from this area and i think you have a, a list here of the regiments with the with higher than 12 you know yeah more than 12 people from this post that served in this particular regiment yeah so um so the uh, 54th massachusetts as we said before i had 13 the 55th massachusetts which is a regiment obviously recruited right after the 54th had 12 and um there were there were um there were a number of regiments that had uh, higher than 12, and uh, this would be the fifth. Uh, these are all United States colored troops, fifth, sixth, eighth, 24th, 25th, 32nd, 41st, and 127th. And um, they, they, had, uh, they had a number of uh, multiple members that had been in those units as well. So, um, you know, like, like I said, a little bit more about them. And then... Um, we also have uh, sub, several Medal of Honor recipients yeah. too, specifically. Yeah. Uh, one that we have, we know 100% sure served, and that was uh, James Bronson, James H. Bronson. Um, we know received the Medal of Honor. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I believe it was for taking command, right? It's, yeah, uh, the, yeah the at a critical time. Yeah. This is at the Battle yeah. of uh, Chapin's, Chapin's Farm. Farm. Mm -hmm. um, he takes command and, and has to lead troops and receives the medal. And we know he belonged to Post 206. Yeah. It's documented in the book. He has a page. He has a page. Alexander Kelly, we have kind of conflicting reports. He was another Medal of Honor recipient. His He received it um, basically because of the, um, uh, the protecting the flag, yeah. which is one of the common ways yeah. that individuals mm -hmm. were receiving it at the time. He, he rescued and prevented the, the colors from being captured by the enemy. So uh, he received the Medal of Honor. But... We have, like I said, conflicting reports if he actually was a member of Post 206 or not. Right. There's one source that claims he is, but his name doesn't appear. In but, the book. but he's not in yeah. our book. So um, that's unfortunately kind of where we are with him. Um, but all this great information and, and the fact that we have all these great numbers, uh, this is maybe a good time to point out. A lot of this was data was put together by um, a friend of mm -hmm. soldiers and sailors. Diane Kleinfelter um, did a book. Um, the Grand Army of the, uh, Grand Army of the Republic personal war sketches. It's kind of sitting here right in front of us. And uh, she she's the one that compiled yeah. a lot of this data. So like when it comes to knowing that there were more yeah. than 12 um, individuals in a certain regiment, um, we're thankful for, yes. for a lot of her research and compiling those numbers for us. Um, from here, we can move on to one of our stories we have here, and it's the story of Matthew Nesbitt. All right. And um, I'm we don't have this paperwork right in front of us here, um, but I think we know enough about him here. Matthew mm -hmm. Nesbitt uh, was born a slave. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, he, he dictates that in his story. Mm -hmm. He says, I was a slave mm -hmm. owned by William Nesbitt in Georgia. Mm -hmm. And uh, so right there, how powerful is that? Yeah. Right on that page that you're looking at, that yeah. we have a reproduction of this page also on display at the museum. You read his words yeah. of saying, I was born a slave. Um, and was property of an individual, William Nesbitt. Yes. Um, that's where his, obviously, he gets his name from. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, you know, like like we we said before, I always imagine Nesbitt sitting in front of the historian and right. telling his story, his story and saying, I was a slave. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just the, yeah. his words echo through time in yeah. so many ways. Um, but from slavery, he finds his way to free, and free, uh, freedom and serves in the uh, Union Army mm -hmm. yeah. um, and uh, doesn't have the best of times. He goes yeah. through some tough times. He gets very sick during yeah. his time in service. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, he's, he's a prisoner of war yeah. uh, during his time in service. And that's something we could speak about a little bit, like how dangerous it was 
Uh-huh. Um, and the fear of being captured, right? I mean, what, what well, especially for a black soldier, right? That's what I'm getting yeah. at here. Yeah, yeah, because the Confederate um, hierarchy uh, was very incensed that uh, Lincoln would raise black troops and right. they would be armed, and they they kind of put out a mandate as as such to uh, if if these soldiers were captured, uh, they would either be returned to slavery or put in slavery. Right. Had they been free before, they now would be a slave, or they would be executed. Or hum. Yes. So the stakes were very high, uh, and this was all, um, like, like you said, being put out there yeah. in a way to, to, to be as a fear tactic. Well, and every every colored troop soldier knew that, right? Yeah, yeah. they, they, they knew, all knew, right? Yeah. That, uh, they that could be gonna, their fate. Yeah, yeah. they were not going to be treated as a soldier. You know, we know there are rules on how you should treat mm-hmm. a captured soldier, a prisoner of war, um, but none of that was going to be applied to right. the, to the black soldier. Right. So. Um, but he does make it through. He escaped. Uh, yeah, yeah. He, yeah, exactly. Yeah. He escapes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, like we said, goes through, I, I think, uh, I can't remember what he, he had uh, got sick. Though, measles. The measles. Yeah, that's what measles. Yep, yeah. The measles. Yeah. And uh, survives that. Yeah. And uh, gets through the war and lives in Pittsburgh a, a mm-hmm. free man. Yeah. And uh, married for a second time. His first wife had passed away. Right. So, yeah. And uh, belonged to Post 206, as we know. This is his page here. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I believe he lived not even too far from here. I think it was. He lived on Myron Avenue. Yeah. yeah. So we're, we're Which is three blocks. blocks. Yep. Three, four. Yeah. A few blocks. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Not yeah. far down the street. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, he died in 1910. So we don't really think he ever visited here. Right. But uh, he probably saw this place being built. Yeah. He yeah. at least would have seen some of the early construction of the yeah. building. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and could have walked right past it if, sure. if he was out, out and about. So um, that's probably one of the most powerful yes. sketches in here. Like Mike said, a lot of these did turn into some kind of generic ones and, and generic stories. Um, and to be quite honest, it is even even his story is kind of hard to understand. I know, you know, yeah. the spelling is not always, always great. Right. And, and some of the and uh, penmanship is yeah of the of the person who wrote it. It's not not always the best. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, still, just the the words and how powerful that is. Um, you know, talking about being a slave and going through that exact transition that Douglas, you know, yeah. how we, where we came from, right. where we started from, is right. you know, how can you deny citizenship to these individuals that serve? So here's an individual that went from yeah. no rights, not even you know, basically property, to soldier, yeah. to free man, yeah. uh, and. You know, that's kind of the part of the theme of our exhibit, you know, slave to soldier and how the army was that avenue yeah. to to gaining that citizenship and that freedom with the, the amendments to the Constitution after the war. So I don't know what we have next here. I think, um, you yeah, know, we had questions, but we had a couple other stories here. So let me get off of this and I'll go to here. And um, we had a couple stories that unfortunately, I don't see, I don't know where the paperwork is for them, but I think we can once again pull this off here. One of them was specifically another individual talking about being a POW. And, um, you know, that individual soldier tells his story as a POW, and he is not executed. He, he is thought he was going to be. Yeah, they yeah, told yeah. him he was going to be. Right. When he was captured, they said they were going to hang him. Right. Yeah. They kept telling him that. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I think they needed labor, right? And they were utilizing yeah, you know, yeah, a lot sure. of the prisoners for, for yeah. labor at the time. Yeah, mm-hmm. He and uh, two others were captured together. Right. And the two others did not survive. They died in a, a prison. And uh, he, he was sent to another another prison, uh, Florence, which he called a hellhole yeah, right. <laughs> in his description. Right. And, uh, and he said it was worse than any battlefield. You know, yeah, that was, is. Yeah, yeah. So here he is. Yeah. You know, going through the war and the worst, the worst situation. And once again, is this this prisoner of war experience? You know, he was exchanged. Unusual. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, there was a time when soldiers were exchanged one for one um, in a process uh, that ended in 1864. But um, he was one of the one of the soldiers that was exchanged for a Confederate soldier. Right. Yeah. So that's another interesting entry that's in there. And then there's another one that talks about. Um, um, kind of this this quote we have no quarter. What is that? What does no quarter even mean? What is that? Um, you know, if you if you've watched enough pirate movies, yeah, right. <laughs> we'll give them no quarter. Yeah. Uh, it just means they're not going to uh, put them up. They're going to uh, kill them. Right. Yeah. They're going. It's they're not going to show them any mercy. Right. Yeah. 
and, and this soldier talks about yeah. basically having that order, right? Yeah, and, yeah. And they're going to go after the Confederates. Yeah, and, and yeah. Show them no, be no order. order. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And obviously, this was very memorable to him because yeah. here he is years later, yeah. you know, telling this. That's the event he remembered. Right. That's what he, he got yeah. out of it was yeah. that time when he mm-hmm. maybe you know thought I you know yeah it, it, this is this is the time to get yeah. the revenge or whatever yeah. the feeling was. Uh, yeah. You know that uh, uh, there was no quarter to be had for the Confederates. So these little tidbits of information, uh, you know, really are fascinating. Um, and you know, so you have kind of two aspects when I think about the book here. You have the raw data, yeah, the numbers, the regiment names, you know, yeah. the, you know, some of the things we've talked about, and then you have just a couple of these personal snippets yeah. that uh, yeah. you know go through and um, you know kind of summarize. In fact, I think one thing that was really interesting is the jobs, right? That that yeah. a lot of these guys had because a lot of them talk about what their job was after the oh, war. Oh, that's one of the fields they had to fill in was right. their occupation. Yeah, and what are some of the things we were seeing there? Well, uh, I made a quick list. They're laborer, teamster, janitor, waiter, minister, barber, clerk, uh, servant, steel mill man, fireman, farmer, river man, and policeman. Right. So these these are um, these are all people who are, are working hard for a living. Right. Yeah. Right. But it, it gives us a cross-section of what – jobs uh, these men were doing, mm-hmm. these uh, African-Americans were doing in Pittsburgh in the late 1800s. Right. Yeah. And then um, one thing I thought was fascinating, and we touched on a little bit when you're talking about the goals and the aims of the GAR and the Orphans Court mm-hmm. was a big thing. And Post 206 certainly played a role in that. Um, they took care of sick comrades. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know if we've used that word enough, comrade. That's yeah. what they called each other. Yeah, right? that's, that, that was, was the, the name. Yeah, yeah, that was kind of the, yeah. the fraternal right. name that they right. used. Um but I thought one thing that was fascinating was the um, support for Ida Wells, yeah. who was very well known, um, one of the founders of the NAACP. Mm-hmm. And uh, at the time that, the, the, that I'm talking about here, she was very much speaking out against the lynchings that were happening yes. in the South. Yeah. And this was post 206, at least in, in symbolically, mm-hmm. you know, showing their support behind yeah. her and her efforts and and denouncing what was happening in the South. So, yeah, they made a formal written uh, statement about it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, at times maybe some of the the activities seemed a little, you know, not as important, mundane, yeah, Yeah. like, okay, social events, (laughs) things like that. But uh, here's a case where they they did unite and and Mm -hmm. come together to to make a a very serious point and and support behind a a very serious issue. Mm -hmm. Um, So, that's post 206. Uh, it's it's one of the most important artifacts we have in our collection. I would say um, absolutely. It's, yeah. uh, I think it's a national treasure. It we, is. We, uh-huh. You know, use that term sometimes to describe the medals of honor behind mm-hmm. us. But I think this this is in the same yeah. boat because this information just isn't out there. No. I mean, uh, this doesn't exist, and and uh, we have this this wonderful yeah. treasure trove of it. Yeah, we do have a. You know, if, if you're interested, we have. Uh, Diane had dissected it enough to we, we have a roster of everybody right. of all the names and you know we'd be happy to share that if you'd like to email us or mm-hmm. and uh, you know this is a time one more time I'd just like to thank Diane Kleinfelter for all of her uh, hard work in this um, really like I said compiling all this information for us and this is her her book here this is this is what we're working from here and it's filled with Great information about these individuals, although it's not really the sketches as much, but it's a lot of the raw data once again. Yeah, yeah. You know, who served? She does do a deep uh, personal study into Matthew Nesbitt yes, and his yeah, story. Yeah, um, and really traces his roots as best she can, and using her genealogical tools to, mm-hmm. to do that. Yeah, it's so, very fascinating. Yeah, um, and you know that really brings us back to soldiers and sailors too, because as we said, you know they met here. Uh, they could have met in this room. Yeah, um, definitely. You know, it's just so so amazing to think about. And uh, at this time, I'd like to see if there's any questions. Um, I see that, uh, you know, there was a question here um, that looks like it was to Rich. So Rich is, is taking questions. <laughs> He's our um, silent partner tonight. Right. Um, Martin Bookser, he was in company. But you're going to look it up for him. Does anybody else have any questions out there? Well, I see Rich, uh, Rich chimed in, too, as far as... Uh, Shaw with the dead of the 54th have, have been moved and they're now in the national cemetery in Beaufort, South Carolina. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Which is where Rich is working. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, he, he should know that. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, we'd like to open it up. If there are any questions at all, we'd be happy to answer them. Um, and you just have to post here. Let me see if we've got any via the email here. No, nope, nothing on there. What I'll do though, in the meantime, while maybe some people are thinking about questions, 
a little bit more about us. Uh, we've touched on soldiers and sailors and how, you know, what we're all about. So I encourage you all to come visit us. We are open to walk-in guests. You can also schedule a guided tour by appointment and schedule that with us. Um, we have all kinds of programs. We encourage you to visit our website, soldiersandsailorshall.org, um, to learn more about how to visit us and everything that's going on here. We have an events calendar that sums all that up. We actually have coming up in just two weeks our John L. Ford Sr. African American Heritage Celebration. Um, this will be taking place Thursday, February 24th from 7 to 8 p.m. Um, it will be a virtual program once again, and uh, it'll focus on breaking barriers in World War II. So today we talked a lot about Civil War. Mm -hmm. At this program, we'll be talking about World War II and specifically how a city forged in steel, along with Pittsburgh's Courier's Double V campaign and Western Pennsylvania's Tuskegee Airmen paved the way for civil rights in America. Um, so it, it's almost a nice kind of companion piece to this. It's that next, yeah. that next generation. And it's not a generation, but yeah. that next, uh, right. you know, step in, in towards the civil rights part of uh, the story. Movie. Yeah. It's part of the story. That's a good way to put it. And we're very lucky to have um, a special guest. Jaquay Carter will be joining us. He's a historian and a United States Marine Corps veteran. He'll be one of our panelists. Uh, and uh, we have a moderator, Sonia Ford, who is John L. Ford's daughter, will be joining us. So um, that's a wonderful program coming up in two weeks. Uh, once again, right here on Facebook, on YouTube uh, for our African-American heritage. Um, here is a question. Are there any known buildings still standing where po post 206 met aside from soldiers and sailors? I don't think so. I, I think they were uh, on the Hill District, which yeah. has been pretty much gutted. Right. Um, I'm not aware. I know one was on Wiley Avenue, mm -hmm. but um, so much has changed there that I, I would doubt it. I, I should check into that. We don't actually have addresses. Right. We have some street names, yeah, but not much right. as far as specific addresses to be able to. Yeah. It would know. take a little business directory digging or right. something like that. To right. get them. So, of course, Rich, you stumped us on, our, on your question there. But we do know it meant, you know, Wiley Avenue was one we know for yeah. sure. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then next month, our next spotlight on, we'll focus on women in the military. Of course, we are focusing on African-Americans uh, this month for African-American History Month. Uh, and because it's just an important topic. And next month being Women's History Month, we'll be focusing on women in the military. And that'll feature Major Kathy Silva a retired army officer, and she was one of the first women to graduate from West Point in 1980. So yeah, we'll get to hear one. her story and some of the trials and tribulations she went through. So we're really looking forward to that. Uh, she's made some donations to the museum, so mm -hmm. we have some of her things as a part of our collection. Um, so I think that'll be a wonderful program coming up next month, which will be March 10th, 2022. So we have two wonderful virtual programs coming up um, just in the next month or so. Um, and that's going to bring us to the end of the program, unless there's any other questions. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining us uh, this evening. And um, we uh, thank you for, you know, all of the times that you've joined yes. us. Uh, I think, you know, we've been doing this now for uh, just over a year. This actually will mark the, a year that we've Is been it? doing our virtual programs. And um, I think last year, you know, with, with this program and the, our varsity tutors program, we reached almost 10,000 yeah. uh, viewers to our virtual program. So it's something that is um, really meant a lot to us. And, and we're so all of you out there, just thank you for joining us and please continue to do so. Come to the museum too. and come to the museum. <laughs> yes. So have a good night, everybody. And uh, we'll talk to you soon and we'll see you uh, at our next program. Take care. Thanks. Bye.